culture and the understanding, understandings which it contains and that the media fashion is made rather in the manner of a pointless painting in which a picture is constructed from tiny dots of pure color the one has to step back from and which viewed from a distance form into a recognizable shape in this case the picture of a germ that was an existential threat to humankind as the narrative of HIV AIDS unfolded in the months and years after Margaret Heckler's uh, press conference it was fed by a marriage of exaggeration and a public disposition to believe tall tales in the middle 1980s the talk show host Oprah Winfrey told her, her audience that 20 percent of all all heterosexuals would be dead of AIDS by 1990 Gene Antonio in his book The AIDS Cover-Up, which sold 300,000 copies, claimed that by 1990 there would be 64 million infected with HIV in the US. The television program and video AIDS, The World is Dying for the Truth, in 1988, began with the words, in the course of human history, never before has a force either natural or man-made had a more devastating impact on the human race than a small virus. HIV. The script then quotes WHO figures of 100 million dead by the end of the century and states that the AIDS epidemic, quote, poses a threat to mankind unparalleled in recorded history. One scientist giving evidence before Congress that was covered by the media said that she projected 5 billion infections, um, but that it could go as high as 10 billion. <laughs> How do these people become scientists? That's a good, my great mystery. The fact that this was twice the population of the planet did not seem to phase her. <laughs> William Connor of the Hive Foundation referred to a threat that, quote, exists on a species level. A species conflict is occurring. Put another way, it is us or the bug. As I read more, trying to understand the potency of the HIV argument, why did I gain such traction in the media and the public imagination, I was clear that the basic argument that HIV is a harmless virus, that AIDS may be a non-infectious condition acquired by recreational drugs and other non-contagious risk factors, including the toxic effects of anti-HIV anti treatments, um, and that therefore AIDS is a condition which is self-inflicted, would not be popular in some key circles. <laughs> Got that one right. Um, in fact, what was becoming increasingly obvious was that the strength of the paradigm depended not on any definitive scientific merits of the case, but rather upon a collusion of institution, institutional and cultural forces, for which the media became the partly unwitting cheerleader. In one search, it was possible to find arguments that pointed to other causalities from the very beginning. But the brute truth is that the media weren't looking, didn't want to look, and probably didn't know how to look. So, for example, they didn't report on David Durax, I think that's how you pronounce his name, uh, lead editorial in the New England Journal of Medicine, which asked the interesting question, then and now, of why AIDS is apparently new when viruses and homosexual behavior are as old as history, and suggested that, and I quote, some new factor may have distorted the host parasite relation. So called recreational drugs are one possibility. Perhaps one or more of these recreational drugs is an immunosuppressive agent. End quote. I found it interesting that here was a lead editorial in one of the world's leading scientific journals, and it was basically totally ignored. And in some cases, even if the media had been looking, they could not have found studies such as Harry Avakos's 1982 report for the CD3 uh, of drug use of a among a sample of gay men. His report, as we all know, never was never made publicly available. Though I would actually think that if any journalist with any sense of ability, any sense of credibility, if they had wanted to, they would have found Harry Avakos's report. They simply didn't want to. The media, rather than questioning and digging, instead, and partly at government behest, adopted a somewhat paradoxical position 
on the one hand playing off homophobia and moralizing and suggesting that this was a gay plague, on the other pursuing the line that dominated the education campaigns that we all remember, at least I remember, that we're all at risk. Posters on billboards urged people not to, quote, die of ignorance. Every household was leafleted with the message, message, anyone can get it, man or woman. Posters declaimed, age is not prejudice, it can kill anyone. Quote, uh, the longer you believe AIDS only affects others, the faster it will spread. AIDS, don't die of ignorance. The popular press has ever committed to demonstrating the integrity of the fourth estate, pronouncing the headlines, revenge menace from young male prostitutes. Another headline, infected men deliberately, continuing, deliberately continue to take on lovers without mentioning they have AIDS. Another headline, the deadly revenge of age victim who went on a sex spree. I think that was from a British newspaper. British newspapers like the phrase sex spree. It's <laughs> <laughs> we're, kind of, we're kind of, you know, sex spree. It's, uh, uh, the Brits invented tabloid journalism, you do realize that. So. <laughs> <laughs> and we, ta we, taught, we taught you. Um, uh, prostitutes spread it like wildfire, and so on and on, all guaranteed to sow pub uh, fear among the public. What we can, in fact, see in the coverage of AIDS is the highly problematic nature of news. It's constructed but limited character. And if it's constructed, then someone is doing the constructing. And that construction is guided by powerful and persistent news values. As I continue to think through the manner in which the HIV AIDS, uh, HIV AIDS thesis have been so successfully sold, I notice that a particularly important narrative, one that could be readily used by the news media, was that of plague. In public discourse, and in, in its refraction in the chatter of private lives, there was a strong sense of the idea of innocence and vulnerability a victimology amplified by a larger collective ignorance, a profound sense of the innocent, the non-infected, once more open to malignant forces over which they had little or no control within their own lives, once again potential victims of plague. And once again, this was readily fed by popular culture. You may recall the 1995 non-fiction bestseller Richard Preston's The Hot Zone. As its cover suggests, a terrifying true story. A lot of this coverage always feels like it's been told at Halloween. The stories about the Ebola virus, a particularly nasty organism with a kill ratio of about 9 in 10. Of concern to the author is that the virus, which originates in Equatorial Africa, turned up in 1989 in some monkeys in a research laboratory in Reston, in Reston Virginia. That is, within coughing distance of the White House. The narrative is structured around a military operation to prevent the virus leaving the lab and entering the civilian population. It is a riveting story, which is why it was a bestseller, playing off some primal human fears. But as I read it, the thought that kept occurring was how overwrought the writing was. No grotesque metaphor too overblown to be avoided. A writing style which oozed hyperbole about the depths of the threat from this creature that has crashed out of its jungle home. <laughs> in, the in the final... He, he made a lot of money off this book. This is, this is pure jealousy on my part. <laughs> I got a royalty check from Oxford University Press from my last book the other day. It was $17. <laughs> We're not retiring anytime soon. That's my wife. Um, uh, uh, in the final pages, the book recounts the visit Preston made to the now deserted building which had housed the monkeys in which the virus cooked. That's one of his terms, cooked. His final words are, Ebola had risen in these rooms, flashed its colors, fed and subsi fled and subsided into the forest. It will be back. <laughs> I couldn't help but... <laughs> I couldn't help but conjure up an image of the virus checking in at Kennedy International <laughs> for, for a return flight to Zaire, down but not out, waiting for the return match. At almost exactly the, mo the moment that the hot zone was being published, Britain had its own brush with the bug from hell, Streptococcus a bacterium, which can cause the disease known as necrotizing fascistis. Ah, uh, sir? 
I'm sorry, I put 